question was brought up about this false sense of I. And if we are to give up the use of the word I, how do we give it up? Well, of course, we don't really give it up. The question of how we use it. We do not become ridiculous in the use of language. We do not make ourselves a laughing stock of the public. We merely, within our own being, come to a realization of the meaning of the word I and use it as much as we can in its right sense within our own being. For instance, if you say to me, where am I going from Portland, I will certainly say, so far as I know, I'm going to Seattle, because that's where I have engagement. Now, you might say, where are you going from Seattle? And the question, the answer would be, I don't know. There is where the I, or the use of the word I, stops for a while, and we say, not to the public, but to you, I would say, we'll see what unfolds next, or what God's plan is next, as it's revealed. <clears throat> and uh, supposing something happened between now and the time to go to Seattle that I didn't get there at all. I would expect that you would know that in some way or other the hand of God had been shown to me to change that. In other words, that I wasn't bound even by a human obligation to go. I wasn't even bound by a promise to be there if God in some way showed that that was not the place to be or that something more important was calling somewhere else at that moment. <clears throat> And you would have to trust your guidance as to whether your commitment was the most important or the other thing. In the same way, if a choice came between going to two different places, we would have to do as the eleven disciples did, say, Father, show us whom thou hast chosen. Father, show us what direction am I to go? Which city am I to go? The eye would still be there, but it would be in a secondary position. God would be the one that would be consulted. Now, the idea is not to drop the word I out of our vocabulary, but first place, drop it in the sense of personal responsibility. Supposing that we were treating, we would give the treatment the highest sense that we knew. We would give the best treatment we were capable of and be sure that we waited for some kind of an inner response. But then we would have to give up the personal responsibility and not go around worrying whether the treatment was going to work or whether it weren't what was not going to work. There is where the eye goes out the window. You have done your best, and you have let God uh, put the seal on it. Now the responsibility lies on God or on the treatment, and that is where you have to remove the personal sense of I and stop the fearing or stop the worrying. It isn't giving up I, it's making a proper use of it. It is understanding, first of all, that the real I is God. That I is the reality of our being, and we turn to it for guidance, wisdom, direction, support, supply. Then, uh, with what unfolds to us, we make the best use of it we can in what we call the human scene or human footsteps. Again, uh, even though we do not advertise this work, when I'm coming into a city, I'm very apt to have a notice sent to those who are interested. That isn't advertising. 
And that's not trying to increase the work. That is not trying to even build it. That is merely trying to be courteous to those who have expressed a desire to be kept posted or know about it. Now, if there were an intent to advertise, that would be an intent to build up. That would intent might be an intent to glorify I or even the teaching. Whereas to let God move its own teaching, then if an individual writes and says, put me on your list or let me know when you're going to be back in town or when a new book comes out, then that I would be courteous enough, the human I, to send out the notice to keep one posted, to indulge in all of the kindnesses and courtesies that are part of divine love. But any attempt to uh, fill newspapers with advertising or to uh, seek a lot of personal notoriety or publicity would be nothing more nor less than a glorification of the self. Not in any publicity or any advertising that came unsolicited would be construed as an action of God, not of, of the, that has happened over and over again. It is one reason why I stopped the use of photographs in the center of light. In all my entire ministry, I have never used a photograph or given one to anyone. And keeping the, the personal side of, of my experience out of my ministry. When they started publishing these things in the center of light, because it was a newspaper, they didn't believe that the public would be interested in anybody that they didn't see the photograph of. You all know the theory of newspaper and magazine work today. 99 pictures in one line of print. The public isn't supposed to really have enough intelligence to understand print, but they can all understand photographs. That's the theory of the newspaper and magazine world. Very little print and a lot of photographs. Well, uh, they use these photograph until it was evident to me at least that even for that purpose it wasn't right. And since then we stopped them, they're not running them anymore. There is no need in this work for pushing the personal self forward because either God does it or one shouldn't be forward and then it comes about in ways that the I does not have to do. Now the same thing is true in the business world. Many people in the business world use even publicity uh, forums to get them publicity. And they believe that there is a necessity for that. Probably there is if they haven't the sense of I that is God. But with the right sense of that I, you'll find that there are many people doing wonderfully in the business world that never indulge in this per personal publicity stuff. It is not giving up the word I, it is making the proper use of it. It is putting it in a secondary position as it applies to the person. It is learning always to turn within for the fathers, for the real eyes, government, direction, wisdom, and support. And above all, it is this. The real I that I am because God is its substance, law, and activity, is not confined to this body or this room. And therefore, it is as though it were a presence, an intelligent presence, that could go before us and do all things for us. It can go out and make known the intent of our heart and the integrity of our work. It can convey ideas to others that we ourselves could never do. You remember Emerson? What you are shrieks so loudly I cannot hear what you say. Well, that's the idea. The life that a person is leading can convey a greater idea right out in the world than any of the things they may say or do themselves. And it is for this reason, then, that much and many of the things that we do in a purely human sense would be better off left undone to let this 
itself of our speech rather than our text of step. There are so many ways uh, that you will find that in uh, illustrating. One, uh, the simplest one of all probably would be this. How many times have you felt the urge to telephone to someone and before you could do it, they telephoned to you. Well, now, there is probably the simplest form of it I know. The mere fact that a need exists for you to be in touch with someone or for them to be in touch with you will bring it about even if uh, you don't do it, even if you're just, well, I'm going to, or there is a need for the contact. You will either make the call at the right minute or it will be made to you. So it is, there are times without number that we would go out and humanly do things, spend a lot of time and not get it done, when uh, merely remembering within ourselves that it probably should be done and waiting and then finding it done for us. There is an invisible self, this is the secret, there is an invisible self that knows our need and it fulfills it. And so all we do is attempt to use less of the personal pressure, the personal self, the personal will, the personal desire, and actually recognize that there is an invisible inner self that's continuously doing things for us, imparting wisdom for us, and growing to us. Here are a question. If there are three or four people on your treatment list, do you give each one a specific time? If so, do you pause in between and change over? Since you are meditating on God only, how do you make the change? If you take all at once, how do you get to feel that the work is done? No, you cannot take all at once. That's an utter impossibility. And the reason is, they do not all come at once, except in this sense. That if I am thinking of a class, naturally I'm not thinking of a group of 10, 20, 30, or 40 people. I'm thinking of the group, the class. And uh, if I were going to do some work, which I do many, many times a day, it would be in this way. let us say, uh, during these last few days here when we've had this uh, prevalence of colds in the city. Naturally, at some time or other, the thought would be bound to come to me about that condition. And uh, immediately, I would remember this. We are not affected by it. Now, I won't name you I won't take 40 names. I'll merely know that we are not affected by this for one reason. We as a class. God is individual consciousness, the consciousness of you and of me, the consciousness of the class. And into that consciousness, nothing to fire us or make us alive. And uh, from then on, I would not think of the class I would be thinking of God and the principle involved. The principle is that God is the consciousness of this class. God is the consciousness of individual being, and into that consciousness nothing can enter the defile to make it a lie. Now, in this divine consciousness, there are no laws of matter, there are no laws of weather, and the belief cannot operate in an all-intelligent mind, soul, or consciousness which is God, which is our consciousness. And uh, by continuing along that line, sooner or later I would get to a point where I feel all is well. Now then, supposing I come into the room and uh, I see or hear evidence that some of this belief has crept in. Again, I will not treat the individual. Oh no. I will turn again who, even though I may be conscious of some specific individual, I won't treat them. I'll turn again to this principle and realize uh, this is not law, 
This is not cause. This is not a fact. There's only one presence. There's only one power. And I'm not going to accept this evidence of the senses. And then I would get still until I felt the presence of God moving, and that would be the end of that. Now then, it might be also that there would be times when I would be thinking of my family, and I may not uh, think specifically of each member, but I would just take it the same way as I would take class and remember that God constitutes the mind, the life, and soul of my family. Nothing can enter from without because all law and government is from within, that one divine consciousness which is the life of the individual, of the family. And then uh, after a little of that, I would get quiet till I felt that presence of God, and that would be the end of that. But except in case, or if I were a teacher in a schoolroom, that's how I would uh, treat. Or if I were a teacher in a Sunday school room, that's how I would treat. Or if I were a minister of a church, that's how I would treat. I would treat, first place, remembering that I'm talking about the church, the congregation, and then I would drop immediately from there, or raise immediately from there, into the realization that since God was the church consciousness, and God was the consciousness of every individual who constituted the church, and so forth, and then go on from there and leave people out of it. Now, except for that, you rarely have an occasion to treat uh, a blanket treatment. Oh, you would when you were thinking of uh, the armies and navies of the world or the people at the front. You would the same way. You wouldn't pick out an individual and think there was one truth about one and a different truth about another one. But you would realize that since God was the consciousness of everyone involved in the situation and then go on from there. That, however, does not apply to our individual practice as practitioners, nor does it apply to the individual problems of our home life. All of these must be treated in an individual way, and it is in this wise. I wouldn't care whether there were three or four people on the list of three or four hundred. The process is the same. The moment an individual asks for help, that's when they get the treatment and nobody else. You can't put their name on a list and say, I'm going to give them a treatment tonight. That's another impossibility in the infinite way. You have got to give the treatment the very moment that they come to your thought, whether they telephone, write, telegraph, or whether you're just standing here and all of a sudden they come into your mind. It is at that instant that the treatment takes place and not one minute later. If somebody came into my thought this very minute while I'm talking to you, they would get the treatment while I'm talking to you. I wouldn't dare wait even one minute to give the treatment. Why? Well, there's only one time to correct the belief of two times two is five, and that's when it comes to me. And if I just write down two times two is five, I'm going to look this up this afternoon. I have already accepted it. Now I've got a job on my hands. When it comes to my thought, when it is brought to my attention, is the exact moment of the treatment, the exact moment of the reinterpretation, or unfolding. The moment a call comes over my phone, the moment a letter is placed in my hand, that is the second that I begin my work for that individual. Now remember this, before that's happened, I have uh, done what we call group work. Like when I retire at night, I know that anyone, anywhere, anytime, reaching out to my consciousness, anywhere, must receive the answer instantaneously, that they do not have to wait to personally communicate with me. I know that my student body, anywhere, anytime, can reach out to me and receive their instantaneous help even before I hear from them, or in some cases it isn't even necessary for them to communicate with me personally, just to reach out and uh, 
I'll be there. The answer will come to them. Now, you might call that blanket because I'm not thinking of any individual. I'm thinking of a patient body or a student body. But let a call come. Let me awaken in the night with someone intruding into my thought. Or let me get a telephone call at night or a special delivery letter. Even if I had 300 patients, that one individual would get their treatment at the instant that I get that communication, no matter what form the communication comes in. You know the form my treatment would take. I wouldn't take their name, their face, their figure, their identity, or their disease into my thought. I would turn immediately to God. But... The treatment might be specific in this direction, that if one person phoned to me or communicated and uh, said I'm suffering from the flu or grip or some of this weather business, I might be specific enough in my treatment not to think of them, but to handle that belief of infection, contagion, or world belief of weather or climate, that I might do. Or on the other hand, if the call came and said there were an accident, an automobile accident, a train accident, an airplane accident, I might be specific enough in my treatment to realize that God maintains law and order and sustains every idea in divine consciousness, and that nothing ever has or ever will escape from the harmony, the order, and the law of that divine consciousness. I would be specific in that way. I would never be specific enough to handle a broken leg or a broken arm, or whether the pain was on the right side or the left side, or whether it was up or down, because that would be foolishness. A person could have a pain right smack in the heart and have no heart trouble, and it would just be foolishness to honor it in that way. But uh, I would handle whatever belief came in about it, not organ or function. Supposing a person phoned and said, that uh, they were having difficulty with elimination. I wouldn't bother with the organs or functions, but I would take the idea of elimination and understand that as an activity, it's an activity of mind and therefore would have to be harmonious, would have to be universal, perfect, and uh, not subject to chance or change, not subject to laws of matter, not subject to belief of uh, food, organs or functions. Yes, I would be specific in that sense. Or, supposing it was a uh, marital problem, I would be specific about that, knowing uh, that since God is one, the only relationship that exists is one, and there can be no division or separation in that oneness, no inharmony or discord in one, in itself. The moment you have two, of course, you can have any kind of discord and harmony. You can't have in one. Now, many people believe that uh, because you've made that declaration, that no separation or divorce could follow, that you would be ensuring the couple remaining together. Nothing could be further from the truth. A couple might be married, and they might be legally one, but they may not be... Uh, spiritually one, they may not be actually one in their being, and uh, this realization of oneness might uh, bring about a separation or divorce much more quickly than might otherwise be the case, so that each could find their oneness, not be yoked together in inharmony and discord, but at least be free to realize their oneness. No two people can realize oneness when they're living together in battle and in sin, because uh, a marital relation without love is a sin. And uh, the mere fact that one having a $2 license doesn't change the sinful nature of it. Now then, while we do not intrude into the family life of any person or any couple or any family as to judge humanly whether they should be married or separated. That's not our business, and we have no way of knowing from the outer appearances what's true. 
we will in all cases of marital discord and inharmony hold to the fact that God is the only one, and there's only one marriage, that's the mystical marriage. That's our marriage to Christ ideal, to our higher self. That's our marriage to our highest concept of right, and because that is God-ordained, no man can uh, render that asunder. Now, the very best way sometimes that God can maintain that oneness is by rendering us under the human tie, the legal tie. Never let us believe for a minute that just knowing oneness is going to keep all marriages together because it isn't. Knowing oneness is going to keep us one with our good. And if being one with our good means a separation and divorce, that's the way it's going to have to be in spiritual truth because we do not outline how a demonstration is to take place. It's the same way with parents trying to hold on to children and uh, having a treatment for it, and sometimes it takes them right away from them. Because everything must happen in accord with spiritual good, not in accord with some human's idea of what constitutes good. In this work, we do not set up to uh, decide what is humanly good. That is why very often in the mail, I get letters, especially from people who have uh, been attending some of these mental science places, and they'll say, I want to get married, will you do some work for me? And I write back, of course I won't. I'm not interested in whether you get married or not. My function is to know your spiritual harmony, and I'm sure that if getting married will do that for you, uh, that's the way it'll work out, but if... Uh, not being married will do it for you. My treatment's going to keep you from getting married. You better not ask me to treat unless you're pretty sure that you want it to come out the way God wants it. In the same way, we have requests. You'd be surprised. I'll never forget an incident that happened in Boston. In, uh, two, in just one period of less than an hour this happened, that one woman came in crying her eyes out because she had no family and couldn't I do some work so she would have a family and the very next woman to come in those doors was crying her eyes out couldn't I do some work she was having a family and didn't want it I, said, I don't know what they call this kind of practice here first we give them babies and the next time we take them away from them and that isn't the function in either case it isn't the function the spiritual ministry is properly conducted if we would realize this for every couple that man is not a creator there's only one life that life is god it's self-created self-maintained and it's omnipresent it doesn't come and it doesn't go and it can't be made to come and it can't be made to go it is embodied here now as individual being whether it's visible or invisible to our human sight has nothing to do with it. Life is God and life is here and life is now. And the strange part of it is that in some cases that will bring forth uh, conception and childbirth. And in another case it might prevent it or act in, in a contrary way. Our function is not to enter the human scene with our puny judgment and decide how a thing should go. We must maintain the truth of being as it is and then let the chips fall where they will. But we must handle every case as it comes to us individually, and we must handle it when it comes. Now there's another time to handle it. If I have uh, taken care of the situation the moment it presented itself to my thought, and if I have received the response within, I am through with that case. But, supposing that individual returns to my thought two hours later or two days later, that means another treatment right there and then. They may never know about it. There are times when a patient gets 20 and 30 and 40 treatments but they never know about it. First place, I never make an arrangement for more than one treatment. When you ask for help, you get it. That's it. But that doesn't mean that if you keep coming back to my mind, that you won't get another. 
course, if you ask for help today, you get it. If you ask again tomorrow, you get it. If you ask next week, you get it. Whenever you bring yourself to my consciousness, you get your help or any of our practitioners. But in between, it is assumed that the work was done in that treatment unless something comes to thought to contradict it. And if something keeps pounding at my thought, if you keep coming back, if you kept coming back 20 times, you would get 20 treatments. Because I do not consider that a treatment is a successful treatment until the person and the claim has dropped out of my thought. So I get a sense of peace and satisfaction about it. And therefore, it is my obligation in the work to stand by with that case until I get a feeling of release. If I don't get the feeling of release, then I stick right by. Now, of course, that wouldn't apply if they asked me to stop work. But when a person asks you for help, they're not counting it by dollar bills and they're not counting it by numbers of treatment. They're counting it, I have a problem and I'm asking you for help. So it is your function to give them that help. But after you've given it and felt a sense of relief, you must assume that the burden is on God's uh, shoulder and that it's taken care of. And unless it comes back to your thought or unless you're asked for more help, stop it. That would prevent uh, such things as people saying, I want a week's treatment or I want a month's treatment. If I were to accept uh, such an arrangement as giving a week's treatment, it would be to say, I'm going to give you a treatment today, but I don't believe it'll work, so I'll give you another one tomorrow. Our attitude must be clean cut on this. It isn't as if we were really healing something. When we're asked for help, the help we're expected to give is a realization that such thing doesn't exist. And therefore, there's no use saying, well, I've realized it doesn't exist, but tomorrow I'll do it all over again. If it didn't exist today, uh, it shouldn't exist tomorrow. And as a matter of fact, that is one way, too, in which my treatments are given, that helps these people who write me from a distance and get their answer before I get their correspondence. I continue, every day I remind myself that any error that isn't true today wasn't true yesterday. So if it wasn't true yesterday, no matter who wrote for help or wired or anything else, even while it's in the way, it isn't true. It wasn't true when they wrote it. So it doesn't have to wait for the word to get to me to find out or declare it isn't true. It wasn't even true when they wrote it. In other words, you're predating your uh, treatment. And it's good, and it works. If you will re live in a constant realization of this truth, that this is the only moment, there are no yesterdays and there are no tomorrows, this is the day the Lord has made, this is the moment the Lord has made, and in this moment, harmony is. But the harmony that exists this moment is an eternal harmony. It's always existed. In the kingdom of God, there has never been an error, and there never will be, and that's the only kingdom there is. And as we abide in that, everyone who reaches out to us for help must receive it, and they must receive it at the moment they reach out, since that's when we're knowing the truth. Now, strange enough that many people get the idea of almost watching their mail to see when I'm going to receive it. And very often they'll tell me they know just when I received the letter because they got the help at that moment. Well, actually, they, they'd have a hard time knowing when I got the letter because I may have been home and gotten it there or it may have been forwarded to Portland or to Hawaii. It might chase me around several days. But, actually, they got the help the moment they reached out. But if they were waiting to know that I'm going to get their letter tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock, of course, they'd be putting off their realization of the truth until tomorrow afternoon at two o'clock, and that's when they may get it. They may not get it before they expect it, but there's no reason for that. The very minute that you have an idea of reaching out to a practitioner, accept your help that minute, no matter who the practitioner is, accept your help that minute, because no matter who the practitioner is, they haven't any human power to help you, and the divinity of them, which is the practitioner, is right there where you are. And the moment you think their name, 
You're right in their consciousness and should be receiving the benefit. The moment you think their name, you should. That's the phase of the work that we're watching with a great deal of interest now uh, because it is a new part of the uh, spiritual healing work in which we are trying to have everyone realize that they must have their healing the moment they reach out to me or to any of our practitioners. There is no need to wait around until I get the word because the eye that I am is God. The eye that's going to do any healing work for you is God. It isn't Joel, it's God. God appearing as Joel. So the minute you say, Joel, you should have your help. The God and the Joel that is the practitioner is one. And it's an omnipresent one, wherever you are. That which we call the human sense of Joel, that couldn't help you even if it wanted to. And it does want to, but it doesn't do any good to want. It is the other part, that spiritual entity and identity, there's no reason. That was the secret of Jesus' healing of the centurion's servant. And I know people were shocked at the time, although the uh, centurion wasn't. When Jesus said, oh, I'll go with you right away. And the centurion says, you don't have to go. Send your word only. And the servant was here at that self same hour. And there was another one that had a boy with a fever. And the very moment that uh, the father spoke to Jesus, in that moment, the child was healed. In other words, and of course, the woman who pressed through the throng and touched the robe without Jesus, without Jesus even knowing she was there. The moment, you see, healing takes place in the patient's consciousness. It takes place in the practitioner's consciousness, but there's only one consciousness. And so as the patient reaches out to the practitioner, the healing should take place instantaneously. And we're working more and more along that line now so that we develop this more and more and make of this ministry a real Christ ministry, not a personal ministry, but one in which we realize that Christ is the healer. We're working along that line in another direction, too. And this had its uh, origin in an experience that took place several years ago when I lived in Santa Monica. A lady telephoned and said she was called to Boston in a hurry uh, on some business, and uh, it was during the war. She had no time to make reservations across the country and to take care of anything but get a ticket and run. And said, please give some thought to me as I'm going across the country because I'm in need of every bit of help you can give me. And uh, not that I'll neglect it, but I want you to, I want to be sure you're standing by. And I said, all right, I will. A couple of days later, I got a telegram saying, left the hotel one hour before. I didn't know what it meant until the newspapers came out. The LaSalle Hotel in Chicago had burnt down, many people killed, not where she'd been stopping. She left it one hour before. Well, I was all right. It might have been divine protection. <clears throat> and that incident was forgotten until some weeks later, someone left a copy of Life magazine in our living room. And uh, Sunday morning, I was waiting for my wife and mother-in-law to take them to dinner. I picked up this copy of Life and opened it. And here were all the pictures of the... Uh, LaSalle Hotel Fire, and gruesome pictures they were, too. And, of course, that brought the incident of this woman back to mind. And then as I looked at these pictures, an idea struck me. What would have happened here if uh, there were some people in the world realizing the omnipresence of the Christ Realizing Christ as uh, the ever-present activity up, down, here, there, and all over, impersonally, impartially, and uh, abiding every day for some period of time in an actual consciousness of the presence of Christ, here, there, and everywhere, getting the actual feel of the presence of Christ. And uh, then, if a tragedy of this kind took place, what would happen to those who are part of it, who would lift their thought to that Christ or God, 
would they not find that Christ or God omnipresent? Is there any possibility of discord or disaster in the, the presence of the Christ? Certainly not. The Christ would at any time still the storm, open out a pathway, open the Red Sea, would be the fourth man in the fiery furnace. There's only one thing saved those three Hebrews in the fiery furnace. That was the consciousness of the presence of God, the consciousness of the activity of the Christ, and it appeared as the fourth man, as the protector. Only one thing opened the Red Sea, the consciousness of the presence and activity of the Christ in Moses produced the miracle of the Red Sea and the manna. The only one thing produced the miracles for Jesus, his awareness, his consciousness of the presence of the Christ. They all did it on a collective scale. They all did it on a scale that took in their community. Why, then, should it be an impossibility for us to be so consciously aware of the activity of the Christ and presence and power of the Christ that anywhere, at any time, day or night, anyone who lifted up their thoughts for the Christ shouldn't find it there. Why not? I'd already begun to find that many, many, many of my patients and students have been able to lift up their thoughts to Joel and find him there instantaneously, sometimes even in sight, but if not, in healing. Why isn't it possible then for us to go further and begin a constant realization of the presence and activity of the Christ wherever an individual looks up and opens himself? to see what would happen. And you know, it was a fascinating idea and I couldn't get it out of my mind. And when the folks were ready, we drove into Hollywood. This thing going through my mind continuously that whether a person were up in an airplane falling down or whether they were in a subway, in a uh, submarine falling down, that if they had the realization or reached out for the Christ, our realization of its presence would function for them. Well, it was a good idea to ponder, even if I couldn't prove it at the moment. But I had the conviction it was true. On the way back from dinner, <clears throat> we came down Sunset, uh, came out Sunset Boulevard and turned off toward Wilshire on Whittier Drive. And just as I made the turn off of Sunset Boulevard into Whittier Drive, my wife said, look what's ahead of you, but please remember it's the activity of the Christ. And there was a falling airplane, black smoke pouring out of it, and falling fast. As a matter of fact, it crashed right there at that moment into the top of a house, into the roof, and went right down through the roof into the basement. And the first thing you know, the plane and uh, the house were all aflame. Well, I stopped the car right at the house where the plane uh, fell, and not knowing anything to do, not knowing how to do anything. There was nothing to do but stand there like a bump on a log, praying, wishing I could do something, but not knowing how or what in the face of this mass of fire. And the only thing to do was remember that all this morning I had been living in this idea of the presence of the Christ. And with that, a car pulled up in back of me. A man jumped out, threw himself onto the lawn of the house, crawled into that house with his nose down on the ground, and a few minutes later came out with uh, Hughes on his arm, the aviator and, and uh, motion picture man in Hollywood. Hughes was alone in that experimental plane and had crashed, and it fainted, or if it's not unconscious of the control, he had no more chance to get out of that thing than the man in the moon. He was inside of a burning plane, and that was inside of a burning house. There was only one thing could have saved him, and that's what was. This man was an ex-Marine who had been decorated five times for that same feat of getting into burning airplanes in the service and getting people out. He knew the mechanism of the doors and how to open them from the outside, and he knew how to avoid being uh, inhaling all the smoke and flame by keeping his nose into the ground. And, of course, he had the courage to 
follow up his wisdom. He'd done it five times, and here was another. And here he came out with Hughes. Well, of course, when they got Hughes to the hospital, they said that he couldn't live. It was too late. But Hughes became conscious and wouldn't even allow them to give him a, a hypodermic. He said, you're not going to dull my mind and let me go out. I'm keeping my mind and I'm going to survive. And he did. They call it a miracle even to this day that he survived, but he did survive. And a short time after that, only a few months, drove his airplane east and then drove the biggest plane in the world out of San Diego. Incidentally, he so recognized what uh, had been done for him by this man that he gave him a life contract with his airplane company and also gave him a hundred thousand dollar annuity so that he showed his gratitude and appreciation for a real miracle but the point that i make is this how did that fellow get there at just that particular time at that particular address how did the one man probably in all the world who could have done this thing how could that man have been in that one spot at that particular moment and whether you believe it or not, I believe that because of this recognition of the omnipresence of the Christ that had been going on for three or four hours, that destiny so shaped it that Jews would fall in that spot and that man would be there at that time. And if you don't believe that, I'll tell you the next part of it. That was the only house in that entire area that was unoccupied. Folks that lived there, people that lived there, the man, the husband was a colonel in the army who had just come back from Germany, and he and his wife were at a hotel, and they were going to move back into their home tomorrow, Monday. And on that whole street, it was the only unoccupied house. Nobody was hurt, nobody injured, and Hughes, of course, could afford to build them a new home. It was burnt right down to the ground. And that was that. To me, it is the clearest cut uh, evidence, the whole situation, the fact that it was that particular house, the fact that nobody lost anything by it, nobody lost, not a soul. And uh, out of it all, here comes a crash that could not have helped resulting faithfully, and here is a man who could have been anywhere else in Los Angeles, but at that particular place, at that particular moment. And all coming together so beautifully. No, I don't believe it's chance. I don't believe it's change. I believe firmly and faithfully that we, all of us, were led to that spot at that particular time. I wouldn't be a bit surprised that it even was caused my wife to say, look at this, but remember it's the activity of divine mind. Or you don't think of that right at the minute of a falling uh, plane. No. Since then, we have been working along this line. Our little group, those who have forgotten their human existence and no longer interested in themselves and work only for worlds, they are working on this idea every day of the omnipresence, omni-activity, omni-power, all-power of the Christ wherever anyone lifts their thought to it with the idea of seeing if we cannot the kingdom of god must come on earth sometime can't keep it away forever and what is the kingdom of god there's only one thing that to me could constitute the kingdom of god if at any moment of the day or night i could just look up take christ and find my every need met I would call that the kingdom of God. I don't mean my every desire on that. I may be desiring some wrong things, but I mean my every legitimate need. If every moment of every day I could be assured of harmony, mental, moral, physical, and financial, just by almost the snap of the finger, realizing Christ is here to function, that would pretty well be to me the kingdom of God on earth. And I believe that that can be, I believe that just as well as individuals have experienced the kingdom of God on earth, have lived in such a consciousness of omnipresence that uh, merely to think a thing was to fulfill it, that we can bring that about not by waiting for everybody in the world to get interested in spiritual truth. I think that would be a long wait. 
but I think we can bring it about by those of us who have seen that spiritual truth is a universal law. It's not just a law that we use for our own uh, personal use or selfish use, but that all spiritual truth is a universal law. And by abiding in that, that every time we give a treatment, we're declared a universal law, we will bring it about. We did another thing along this line in uh, Los Angeles. For many years, I noticed that every time there is a cancer drive on the uh, radio, that the cases of cancer reported in the newspapers increase. And every time there's a polio drive, the cases of polio increase. And uh, the natural result of that is this, that you say, well, evidently all of that publicity and fanfare frightens people and increases the uh, cases. And for several years, that's the way it seemed to me, and uh, I would get a little bit rebellious, resentful, whenever these drives would come on the air, saying, well, now watch, here we get more of it, the same way with grip, cold, flu in the wintertime, or virus X. The moment it gets into the paper, that's the time that uh, you get ten times more cases, or twice as many, just three times. Then one day, the thought came to me, wait a minute, I'm as bad as they are. I'm giving power to their propaganda. I'm allowing it to be a power to cause fear and the fear to cause the condition. Wait a minute, this is back in the old psychology and mental science again. Why, this propaganda of theirs on the air can't cause a disease. It can't cause a fear. How can anything cause anything but God? Why, that nonsense can't do anything but blow itself back on itself. So, sat in my office one day and did a lot of thinking about it. And I went right back to my basic treatment of one cause. If God is the only cause, why should I honor propaganda or radio blast or newspaper blast and call them power? If we call disease unreal in the last place, why should we give it a cause? Why? That's all the world is doing. The world is giving power to those broadcasts and to that newspaper publicity, but the metaphysician should be sitting there realizing, no, there's only one power, and that power is God. And so I called our little group together, and I said, here, there's a little job for us. Let's see what happens here, because we've all been honoring, giving power to these broadcasts. Let's see what happens if we don't give power to it, if we can really see the basis of our own work, that God is the only cause. Thus, when the next polio drive took place in Los Angeles, the daily average of polio cases dropped to one a day throughout that whole drive. It was running normally two and three a day before the drive, should have increased under the old belief. Instead of that, it dropped to one. Now, we've watched it in other directions, and we are working on that in other directions, for the realization that these things called cause are in cause. We're doing the same whenever we hit up against this condition that we found here with a strip around and cold around. Why should we accept, not only for ourselves, but why should we accept for our fellow men out there? that they are the victims of something that isn't a cause. Why can't we know that if you're not, oh, it's not only true of our plan, why isn't it true for everybody in the city that God is the only cause? And bring some degree of that realization to anyone receptive to spiritual wisdom. Well, there's only one way of knowing whether or not we'll bring the kingdom of God to earth this way, and that's keep trying and find out if in time we aren't producing less and less of infection and contagion, or seeing less and less of it, through this activity. 
You see why I have said over and over again, this is not a lazy man, Mark. There's some treatment to be done all the time, and uh, even if it isn't for our own uh, bodies or our own health or supply, the very fact of living in that realization, living in the realization of the Christ, has an effect on others and on us. Now, we've wandered away from this. You see now that you cannot give a treatment to a list of people. You can only give a treatment to the individual as they touch your consciousness. Now, there are practitioners who have a list of patients, and when they get up in the morning, they go through that list and give them treatment. But when they go to bed at night, they go through that list and get some treatment. But what I want to ask is this. Why should that be necessary if they gave the treatment when uh, the call came to them? The work should be done now, unless they've been asked specifically for more help. When they wake up in the morning, they shouldn't have any patients. Unless they get a call for it. Now, why should we have patience when we wake up this morning if we've done our work yesterday, last night, as we should have done it? The cases should have been handled, should have been done, unless a call came saying otherwise or unless something came to us within saying otherwise, then we would have to do it over again, but then only individually, not collectively. In other words, I'm trying to bring this out try to get away from that habit of having a list of patients. Don't do it. It doesn't make any difference. I have handled, well, the maximum was my last year as a Christian Science Journal practitioner. In that year, I averaged 135 cases a day, seven days a week. And I never had a list of patients any morning or any night. Matter of fact, I don't keep lists. I don't keep names. Never. Enough for me when I get your letter to do my work and treat it and throw the letter in the wastebasket and forget you unless you come back to mind again or unless you write again or telegraph or telephone. I have no list, just the same as I have no list of accounts receivable. Nobody owes me money when I go to bed at night. If they think they do, that's fine. When it comes in, that's my daily supply that day. But as far as I'm concerned, I have no list of names, no list of accounts receivable, no list of what anybody owes me, no list of treatments to give tomorrow. My treatments must be given at the moment that it reaches my country. And that's all that's to that. Now, it brings about a higher sense of life so that you can live every minute as if that were God's minute. By not having any accounts of uh, outstanding accounts or lists, I can always take the position that everything that I have now is my immediate supply and that at every moment God is supplying it. And I'm never tempted to look in a book and see how much the Joneses and Browns are owe me, because they don't owe me anything. Only God does. And so whatever comes in today is my supply today. And I have nothing to look forward to tomorrow except God. I have nobody, I hold nobody in debt to me. I hold nobody as under obligation to me at any time and any moment. Everyone's free in Christ, and my sole dependence is on God. Now, when I open my mail today, oh, and people give me money today, that's my income. And that's all they have no obligation for tomorrow. In the same way, then, when they call for help, I can take the position... This is the day the Lord hath made, and this is the day they are entitled to their freedom. And this is the day I do the work for their freedom, and this is the very minute of it. And if they drop from for it, that's that. If they keep coming back, they have to have 20 treatments before the day is over, if they keep coming back to my thought. But each time, the treatment will be the highest I know, showing forth God in his infinite, omnipresent perfection. Does that answer that question? 
Now, is there any objection to giving treatment to someone who has not asked for it? For instance, children we love whose parents might not object, yet would not have No. Not only there is no objection to it, it is one of the things that we are compelled to do. We're compelled to do it. Not to intrude into their lives. That's their business. That's their demonstration. But here is a picture being presented to you of discord and harmony. How can you accept it? How can you accept it? How can you say, oh, yes, sir, that's true, and I can't do anything about it? First place, it isn't true. The treatment would consist of your reinterpreting it the minute you saw it. You can't do that. If you saw a sick animal on the street, if you saw an animal being abused, if you saw drunkenness, prostitution, it doesn't make any difference what you see. You've got to treat it that minute for the sake of you. How can you let anything that defile into your consciousness? Right there, you have got to reinterpret that scene. What anyone thinks about it has nothing at all to do with the case. That is one of the things I used to fight about when I was in Christian science. Yet they would publish books about how Mrs. Eddy healed people walking along the street. Well, what right has she to heal those if we haven't the right to heal them? What right has anybody to do anything that everyone else can't do? Oh, no. We have an absolute right.